Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to welcome Professor Will Kaiser from UCLA today for an invited talk on in-network physical adaptation of sense networks. Most of you know Bill. He is a professor at the Department of Electrical Engineering, University of California, Los Angeles. Before that, he has also worked at Ford Motor Research and JPL. He is the inventor of sense networks as I know it. He, he was the first uh, researcher to propose the vision of wireless integrated and network sensing the physical world connected to the internet. And I'll welcome him to start. Thank you. Thank you, Amon, very much. Shall I um, assume this is on here? Sorry. Thanks, everyone. So I, um, good morning. Um, oh, yes. Thanks. So good morning. I, I've really been looking forward to uh, my visit here. Uh, as I mentioned, I, um, last time I was here was in '97, and uh, so um, and uh, I had an outstanding visit then. And as I mentioned to people, I just vividly remember great discussions um, from that time. So um, I look forward to this discussion this morning. Uh, please um, uh, stop me with, with with questions as we proceed. Um, so a lot of, I think, um, uh, ideas here that are really important to us and, and uh, really worthy of, of, of discussion. So I'd like to, to, I'll come back to team members as we go through. Um, the work in this program is supported by the Networked Infomechanical Systems Program, or NIMS. It's an NSF program, a so-called large ITR program, that um, encompasses uh, networking um, and then uh, in-network configuration of sensor nodes. Um, I'll come back and talk about graduate students and staff and, and, and collaborators as, as we proceed. Uh, it's a very multidisciplinary program. Um, our applications range from uh, environmental to um, healthcare. Now, um, I think everyone knows a little bit about the Center for Embedded Network Sensing, um, uh, led by Professor Deborah Estrin in computer science at UCLA. Um, SENS has um, grown and um, has a number of really successful deployments in uh, the physical world of sensor nets. Just a couple of highlights. I'll talk about NIMS, and this was covered back here in the New York Times back in 2005. Um, aquatic monitoring has become very, very important, and I'll mention applications here uh, on that that both uh, lead to interesting system and algorithm problems in addition to applications. And then um, a major breakthrough also was in the development of multi-hop wireless seismic sensors here operating from coast to coast in Mexico across the peninsula here. Um, the objective by Paul Davis, who's a geophysicist, was to understand whether or not there is a subterranean plate that guides seismic uh, energy from offshore earthquakes that, that Mexico um, feels due to the collision of plates here, for example, at the Pacific, uh, guidance of those waves uh, into Mexico City, where Mexico City lying in a caldera um, has um, a loosely um, consolidated soil base, which tends to lead to a large amplitude ground motion for a given seismic input. Uh, this was um, completed last year, um, early in the year, and um, was successful, and in fact actually did um, discover the origin of this plate. And at the American Geophysical Union meeting in, in um, December, again, just with one year of operation from this, there was an entire session devoted to data just from this particular um, uh, array, 18 papers. So it's a um, major breakthrough. Paul said he was going to do this, um, led development of all the systems, and they got deployed. They operated, and the scientific discovery uh, that he had predicted um, occurred. So really a major um, accomplishment. So what um, I'd like to talk about today is um, so in-network physical adaptation on three fronts. Um, one is on sensor sampling, where we uh, encounter an uncertainty due to the fact that we don't have prior knowledge of the nature of phenomena that we need to sample. So we've introduced actuated sensing to deal with that. And I'll talk about adaptive sampling and applications. Um, 
Then there's the other problem that's another sampling uncertainty problem, knowing um, what sensor to apply when, given constraints like the availability of sensors, but also their energy usage. This has led to the development of new platforms and new kinds of energy aware operations. And there's been, on the last few months, really major breakthroughs in this area. Um, and then I'll also talk about a key application in the area of healthcare that's now um, starting to actually dominate um, um, our attention. Okay, so a little bit about the evolution um, and why it is that we're going to, I'm going to talk today about uh, these systems like actuated sensing and so on. Um, so back in the early period, say from the uh, first six years or so, the application of sensor networks was driven by military situational awareness. Now there's a number of subtle points that led to the reason why sensor nets adopted a particular architecture. Well first, there was a well-specified measurement requirement. That is, a military user, not us, not any collaborator of ours said, you will measure and detect, you, that is, you will detect vehicles. And that you are given three sensor types. They're all sensors that are micropowered. That is, the sensors themselves don't require a bias energy. A seismic geophone that requires no bias energy. It produces a, a, an EMF. Um, a, an electret microphone, again, produces an EMF. Um, and uh, an uh, infrared uh, presence detector that, again, requires no bias energy. These are micropower, low data rate, scalar sensors. Um, lifetime in this range. The signal processing problem was also relatively familiar. So, for example, seismic or acoustic beamforming. Granted, maybe a difficult problem, but again, there had been decades of work in this area. Okay? The deployment architecture was simple, determined by the user. Um, we, as, as investigators, wouldn't design, for example, the deployment. Rather, the user said, we'll deploy the nodes, and it will be roughly like this, and you simply need to be compliant to that. Um, and so this led to a resulting node architecture with very constrained capability, very homogeneous, compact nodes. Okay. Um, but uh, today we have a completely different set of requirements. Uh, first of all, the applications are very broad. They're environmental, for example, biomedical, and many consumer applications. Um, the measurement requirements are widely varied, for example, like phenomena mapping. Um, there's an inherent uncertainty, unlike the past, where uh, the measurement requirements were stated. That is, one would be given um, uh, a noise level, for example. Um, uh, here, we don't actually know prior to deployment, or even after deployment, we only might know at runtime what the uncertainty is. Okay. Uh, then the required sensors are markedly different. They go from micropower like in the past, but generally speaking, they're all high peak power sensors. The sensors of interest demand significant energy. Yet we still have a lifetime problem, and the lifetime might even be more uh, longer than in the past. So the deployment architecture, another fascinating problem. Okay, before it was simple, we didn't worry about it. The user stated what the deployment would be. Today, the deployment architecture must adapt to uncertainty. Where is the contaminant? So we don't know that in advance but we must be able to find it. It requires a sensor network. In the example of healthcare, um, we don't know the nature of a symptom or when that symptom will appear. Uh, so it is actually the data that are, it is actually the results in the field, for example, on a subject that is going to determine this. So the resulting node architecture is heterogeneous, um, actuated sensors have to move now, at least some must move, and there's um, sort of a wide range of performance and energy requirements. Now, um, I think this is all interesting, though, from um, the perspective of um, sensor net research. So the first problem is uncertainty and sensor sampling. So I'd like to dis describe to you um, qualitatively the nature of this problem. Um, and then we'll talk um, a bit more quantitatively about it. Um, so uh, the problem is this. We're going to imagine a scene um, that contains a variable of interest. Uh, for example, that might be the concentration of a contaminant or um, might be um, um, some other distribution of, of, of a variable, maybe light intensity in an ecosystem. Okay. Um, now we're going to imagine a space here of temporal and spatial frequency. So here we have a scene. Uh, amplitude represents the variable of interest. And this is the scene. Um, and we would like to be able to map this uh, that is by map, that means measure at a set of points and then reconstruct from that a, a surface that, that uh, achieves a fidelity, that is a comparison with uh, actual ground truth, that meets a user demand. Okay. And the user demand might change. Okay. Um, now, 
Spatial frequency will consider the following. Um, imagine that we can just freeze time for a moment and create a snapshot of this field. Perhaps it's changing in time, but we'll imagine it's just static for right now. We could select transects through this field and compute the spatial frequency associated with that particular transect. Okay. Uh, and then that'll determine, the, uh, and then, uh, for example, we can also um, uh, operate at one location in space and then measure uh, the, uh, a, a temporal frequency associated with any particular location. So this will then place different scenes at different points, like a flat, uniform plane with um, a single variable uh, value would lie at this point. Um, the most dynamic, rough scene would lie up here. Okay, so here's the first example. Uh, a quasi-static smooth field. Well, imagine that we have a field that, that has, um, it's relatively smooth, low spatial frequency, and nearly static, uh, appearing like this. So this occurs. Um, and for example, terrain, plant distribution, our riverbed profile might show a characteristic like this. And the, um, I'm not proving this right now, although we have an investigation underway now for about the last 18 months that, and we'll be publishing soon that will actually provide um, a, a measure of this. So I'm just going to kind of just state without proof, it's more of a conjecture, that um, the appropriate um, network for this is a dense static network or a deterministic scan by an actuated sensor. That is, We'll deploy a set of sensors in maybe a regular pattern, or we'll scan through the environment with a robotic sensor in a regular fashion. Okay, that's the solution there. This is the easy case. Um, here's an example where we have a dynamic field where the field changes in amplitude. Like for example, the contaminant concentration grows. Okay, um, an example of this is a contaminant distribution, and in this case, actually, it's interesting. A static network also may be optimal. A static network because. Um, if, this, if the time variation is fast, one needs to have a static sensor at the particular point um, uh, providing that. Now, um, it may be a guided deployment, that is that those, where to place those sensors is going to require uh, knowledge, either derived from a model or from priors. All right? we, um, you don't want in your deployment to miss this feature that's changing. Um, okay, now, getting more complicated, that that's sort of the quasi-static, the rough field. So we have a field that's very rough, but, but not changing rapidly in time. Water flow distribution. Um, there's been a great deal of effort in this. This lends itself to adaptive sampling. By adaptive sampling, the um, prior approach, the one used up till now, is one that um, explores at low density um, the scene of interest, and then attempts to estimate the field, and on the basis of that field estimate, uh, uh, selects new points for additional sensing. Um, so going back a ways, um, we contributed to this area, and then more recently, Amarjit Singh and my group, um, working with uh, Carlos Gestrin, um, uh, has extended this um, quite a bit further to now um, incorporate path planning, uh, in particular in the case of an actuated sensor or for a um, uh, multiple sensors. And, and in fact, um, uh, Andreas um, and uh, Amarjeet um, have been um, collaborating on this for um, uh, quite, quite some time. This is a huge highlight uh, for, for us. Um, now, let's go a little bit further. Um, so by the way, one, more, one last thing about this. Um, sorry. We apply these methods when the scene is static. That is, it's rough and complex but not changing. What happens um, if, there's, um, if there are dynamics? Well, there's two approaches. One, we need another adaptive sampling method. Or two, um, we move to, um, if, if able to, um, a multi-scale technique. So here, again, we've got dynamic phenomena. Now the scene is rough. Uh, parts of it are changing. Um, none of the the previous examples really fits or, or is, produces a high fidelity uh, approach um, that's optimized relative to resources. Numerous applications are like this. So um, multi-scale methods, um, if available, um, can be applied. That is, where there might be a sensor that operates at low resolution, providing an indication as to where sensing tasks may lie. Okay. Um, so that's multi-scale. I'll go back and talk about uh, adaptive in just a moment. Okay, so, yes? Going back to that uh, 
classification you have. Yes. I, I thought that this is a very, uh, um, give the quite, quite a bit of insight into the spatial versus the temporal right. variations. Um, one thing I would, uh, I would add um, is that, uh, I guess, tracking as a yes. class application would yes. fall towards the upper right scale. It would. It would indeed. Uh, it's in very dynamic. Right. It can be high frequency in the uh, time domain. A absolutely. Um, you're, you're right. I, I would very much agree that, that the tracking problem is extremely interesting. And in fact, actually, I'm glad you asked about that. We've, uh, um, understanding, for example, tracking this contaminant map. Um, is very important, and a model that's derived from tracking, using that as a prior to predict where sampling will occur, is 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 um, essential. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I agree. Um, okay, so um, uh, an application here. I'm going to actually talk about two. One that. Um, motivates the uh, actuation, and then a second one that motivates the need for um, a, a model-based adaptive sampling. Um, okay. Um, the BBC has uh, this phrase, dawn of a thirsty century. So um, water um, worldwide is, of course, uh, um, uh, becoming a very, very important problem. Um, <clears throat> In California, water demand um, is already very severe, and with population growth um, uh, over the next 20 years, um, there's a great deal of concern. Um, California uh, produces up to 25% of the national crop production in the San Joaquin Valley, uh, almost entirely just in three counties. Um, as um, time passes, uh, water is used not just for municipalities, but water is also used for uh, stewardship of the environment. Um, what you might not be aware is how important energy and water are related. In California, 19% of all the electrical energy use in, in California is consumed by the delivery of water, just by pumping and moving water. The water that comes from um, Northern California to Southern California via the State Water Project takes up 3% of all the energy in the state, which is an energy equal to um, one third of all the energy used by all the users that use that water, about 20 million Americans. Um, what you might not also be aware is that about 40% of all the water in the United States is used in the production of electrical energy. So this creates an energy-water nexus. Um, and we could talk for a long time about this. This has occupied a great deal of our attention. But um, it, I think we'll all be much more engaged in this in the future. The outlook is dim. Um, this long-awaited study that was just recently published um, uh, predicts that uh, the current drought condition that we now have will, will continue for, for quite some time. Okay, more can be said about the worldwide community, which again, where again, the problem is very severe. Um, now, one interesting other problem in California that we're investigating right now um, is the dry land salinity problem. Um, so, California has uh, immense agricultural production resulting from the fact of, of great sunlight, uh, fertile soil, and plentiful water. But the water not from rain, but from surface water. Water draining from the uh, Sierra Nevada mountains via rivers like the San Joaquin River and being distributed. This sounds like a great story for agriculture, and it is for a while. But at least it's something called the dry land salinity problem, where arid environments like this um, are threatened. Um, and this is a global threat to agriculture the, um, in the western US and in Australia, where this is referred to as a silent disaster. What happens is, is that water is drawn from the river, spread out over fields, um, percolates down through the soil, uh, collects um, prehistoric layers of salt, which is dissolved, uh, is returned to the river, and then flows back, contaminating the river and contaminating the downstream use of, of the soil. Uh, this leads to 2 million tons of salt annually arriving in our farmlands. Um, the loss of arable land is um, rapid. Uh, the federal government has just invested $2.4 billion to buy up just this tiny sliver, 200,000 acres, in the San Joaquin Valley. That's a tiny, that's like um, a ranch. Um, and um, so uh, there's a great deal of concern over this particular problem, the arrival of the salt and its management. Um, it's unavoidable. Uh, it's said that actually every agricultural society on Earth has ultimately failed as a result of this. Um, uh, the Nile is, um, for a long time, was sustainable, uh, except now when it's been dammed and um, uh, potentially mismanaged. So 
We've been working with um, a team uh, led by Tom Harmon at UC Merced on this particular problem. And it, this has grown in scale. Uh, just in a couple of weeks, um, we have a, a, a conference in Argentina organized by the NSF where a similar problem lies there. And um, we'll be applying techniques um, to uh, monitor this. So let me talk about the sampling problem. Um, it, um, you might imagine that there's several things that are important. One is knowing the total water flow. Now today, um, the method for monitoring water is to place one sensor somewhere in the river and to measure water velocity and to attempt to infer the entire flow from that. Obviously, you don't know the width of the river or the depth so, uh, or the velocity at any other point. So the inference is um, uh, uh, inaccurate. Um, I, a solution for this is needed. Also, we need to be able to measure the total mass flux. Uh, the, neither of these variables are currently accurately sampled. Um, Tom Harmon has developed uh, this experimental location here where the Merced River, a clean river, um, not yet contaminated, and the San Joaquin River have arrived. The San Joaquin River has already flown for several hundred miles before it reaches this point and is heavily contaminated. These two rivers mix here, uh, providing an ideal experimental probe of phenomena. Um, that's what the mixing zone looks like, looking down at that. Which side is Merced? Uh, the Merced's on the right. So this is arriving from straight down from the Sierras. Basically, it's just a drain from Yosemite. Um, and this is the San Joaquin on the left. And th these are, uh, the San Joaquin is, of course, a major western river. Um, that contaminant there is salt. It's actually a selenium salt compound, which is toxic to wildlife. Um, so um, a sensor system is deployed here containing uh, these uh, sensors, uh, again, uh, for chemistry and then for physical properties. Um, and this led to the development of this actuated sensor system that we refer to as NIMS, uh, Networked Infomechanical Systems, that makes use of a cable-supported device that can move back and forth in a pattern um, according to uh, uh, algorithms that we'll discuss. Uh, its key um, capabilities are that it gives us precise control over location. Um, uh, unlike um, other robotic forms that may not be so, so, so precise or, or certainly not in, in these in, in environments. So it can scan and of course um, rise and lower and this allows us then to sample. Um, now. Um, here's an image of NIMS being uh, deployed across one of the, of, of the transects. Um, we refer to this as the RD, or Rapidly Deployable Version. And actually, um, it dominates all of our designs right now. And it was inspired by a very key suggestion by Aman. Uh, as you know, Aman's um, work has focused on um, uh, sensing uncertainty and the application of actuation um, and work ranging from uh, fundamental information theory to experiments. and in um, um, of his um, many key suggestions, he suggested this architecture, which um, again is our um, uh, key architecture now. This is just a view then of the cable system. So this gives us a map. Here is the map actually of salt concentration. On the left is the San Joaquin River, on the right is the clean Merced, uh, ranging from um, really clean water to what would be, uh, again, uh, toxic. Um, water velocity and magnitude, we measure all the different water velocity vectors. Um, pH, um, ammonium, which is a, um, a product of, um, which arrives from fertilization, um, and then nitrate. And here's an interesting story. This looks clean on the left and um, contaminated on the right. Um, this is a result of, of a phenomenon where, as a result of this, um, it's now understood that, that um, a microbe multiplies upstream of this particular location, um, consuming nitrate, and then um, entering an aerobic state where it, it ultimately depletes the water of dissolved um, oxygen. Now we actually have dissolved oxygen data that shows that this is depleted here on the left and in fact accounts for all the dead fish that occur on that part of the San Joaquin. So now, anyways, um, let me just tell you then, uh, uh, all that data was taken through, through uh, in uh, that particular deployment via a deterministic raster scan. Um, not an advanced scanning method. So I'll, I'll show you another quick example here in a second. Um, but um, this was an advance. In the, in the past, um, manual methods and, uh, were tried only very occasionally, and maps of rivers like this were not really done before. A 15-meter stream, uh, one, one example in the literature with 350 points, took two weeks 
uh, of manual sampling. Whereas um, in two hours, um, one gets 6,000 sample points with this particular technique. Um, now, um, an entire program is based on this, and the San Joaquin River is 740 miles long, and there's an interest in mapping the entire river. So obviously, the technique I just talked about is not fast enough. Uh, other things that are important, we now believe that we can um, measure uh, and determine where the river groundwater interaction occurs, that is, where does river water enter groundwater, um, especially important in involving uh, transportation of toxic materials. Urban watersheds in another branch of our work is focusing on marine. Uh, an increase in performance is required. Um, we have to move from um, hours of scanning, which was considered fast when we did this, to, um, to faster. Okay, let me just give you another quick example now that um, uh, describes how we might apply um, a new model-based adaptive sampling to a problem like this, and a different sensing problem. So this is focused on um, algal biomass. So the first problem I talked about was chemical contamination. This one now focuses on biology. Um, phytoplankton are, are microscopic um, single-celled um, uh, microbes. They're actually the largest source of oxygen for us. They're, it's their presence on Earth in the formation of the Earth that led to the oxygen that we breathe. They're the foundation of the food chain. Um, they're also very much responsible for carbon sequestration. That is, they uh, uh, consume CO2 and then sink to the bottom of the ocean, uh, sequestering uh, in, uh, uh, an immense amount of carbon. They may also occur in toxic forms. Uh, you may have read about in Southern California the loss of marine life recently. This was a result of um, a harmful algal bloom and um, a demo the demoic acid that those produce. Um, the objective of this particular investigation with the team and led by uh, Dave Karen and Gaurav Sukhatmi at USC was to map um, the dynamic growth and migration of phytoplankton. Um, so uh, upon observing that we can uh, profile a river, now we can perhaps profile this for the first time. The sensing method is optical fluorescence detection. That is, um, a light is, uh, illuminates the uh, water volume, and the fluorescence of chlorophyll in these phytoplankton is, is determined. OK, so this is a direct measure of bi biological phenomena in a large three-dimensional environment. We're going to examine the lake. Um, the distribution of these uh, microbes depends upon um, light, nutrient, um, and transport, and it evolves rapidly in time. So um, here's what's happening. So, uh, um, phytoplankton. So again, these are microscopic animals that live in the water column. Um, now, they need light and they need nutrients. They um, get their energy both from um, photosynthesis and also consuming nutrients. Light enters the lake um, and is, of course, intense at the surface, but then dies off quickly. So light intensity is lower as we uh, go further into the water column. Um, nutrients um, are heavier than water, the things that, that are consumed by the phytoplankton. And so um, they uh, sink and are found at, at depth. And the depth of the nutrients also depends upon uh, temperature, because um, it will be a thermocline or a temperature um, an interface between um, uh, two regions that will um, track material like uh, this. So what we'll find is that chlorophyll concentration, that is where the phytoplankton lies, will be at some um, point that optimizes the availability of nutrients and light. And in fact, it may be that um, it's believed that either some form of convection or the phytoplankton's own motility allows them to circulate back and forth, alternately um, collecting uh, nutrients and then collecting light. Um, so again, along with Gaurav Sukatmi, who is a roboticist, and Dave Karen, uh, a marine biologist, um, we examined the phenomenon in this particular lake um, here, um, a, a mountain lake in Southern California. Um, there's a set of, of, of buoys that provide uh, temperature measurements, and then NIMS. And here's the NIMS device scanning back and forth across this lake. That's the NIMS shuttle. Um, the two anchor points you can't see here. Um, but, um, and the sensor payload uh, is, is immersed at this particular point. And this operates autonomously, and uh, we operate during the day and through the night because 24-hour measurements are, are critical. Um, just to give you a quick example of what happens, um, here's a map of biomass distribution. And uh, by the way, this data uh, comes from the um, work also of, of Mark Hansen, a statistician at UCLA who's um, absolutely fundamental to all the work I've uh, been 
been talking about. So here we are at one o'clock in the afternoon. Um, the light green here indicates the presence of chlorophyll. Um, and uh, as we go to two o'clock, four o'clock, we see this sink. Um, and finally, um, uh, we'll, we'll cycle back up uh, later in the, in the day. So we, that's the first measurement we know of of this, this type of a profile. Now, however, it changes fairly quickly. In order to get an accurate measurement, considering the fact, um, well, we have these problems. First of all, we need to get a map of this chlorophyll concentration. Uh, we, have, we need a sampling accuracy that meets the user requirements. The sampling speed is limited by the sensor response. It must dwell. Um, and transport speed. We have to optimize sampling time given a fidelity requirement. So the conventional approach was an iterative approach. We ex there's an explorative sampling of an unknown field. We estimate the field. We then select new sample points based upon, for example, the local curvature of the field, uh, um, uh, perhaps a rule-based technique for, for selecting uh, new points. Now, the results of this method in the past we found, and I, I think is typical uh, in the literature, is that there might be a 20 to 40 percent improvement in uh, sampling density. That is, applying this method over a simple deterministic raster scan might lead to a 20 or 40 percent uh, reduction in resources. Um, a model-based approach, however, uh, is now the focus. And this is what, um, uh, so I know uh, Amarjeet and uh, Andreas um, and Mark um, Gorov and others are pursuing right now. So um, imagine that one has a model that uh, you could, that, uh, well, imagine that there is a sensor system that is low cost in terms of resources that can provide knowledge of a model that can be exploited then to guide sampling. Um, if that was true, we could use this low cost sensor system, low cost in terms of, of time resources, to guide sampling. So there is such a model, um, the spatio-temporal temperature distribution. The presence of a thermocline, that is, um, this change in slope in temperature with time, um, leads to a, a, a trapping of, of material, whether it's phytoplankton or nutrients. Um, here's a plot taken at one point during the day of temperature versus um, a, a spatial plot of the lake. So we have depth versus distance across the transect. It's, it's highly compressed. So this is uh, 40 meters here, and then uh, just uh, four and a half meters deep. OK. Now, first um, uh, key model point is that this is um, stratified in a layered fashion. That is, it's planar. So we can exploit that. In the case of the river, you might have noticed the opposite case. Actually, the river uh, model, because of the just uh, river hydraulics, shows um, actually a vertical stratification. And so adaptive sampling there must take that into account. But just focusing on this. Second thing is, this, here's a plot, again, this is NIMS data, and this is NIMS data over here at different times, where we're looking at one particular vertical line. And what we see here is at 7 o'clock, the temperature rises with depth, reaches a point where uh, it doesn't change with depth, and then we see a bulge in temperature. So, and then um, let's start at 9 o'clock in the morning. At 9 o'clock in the morning, we see the temperature is nearly uniform and then falls, okay? And then um, as the sun rises and begins to illuminate the water, we see the temperature at the surface rising and then returning back to this uh, previous point with a peak here late in the day. All right. Now, so that should indicate that an adaptive sampling approach is, is, is appropriate. We know this is layered. We know that a few sparse measurement points could pin down um, an estimate of the temperature distribution. That then should tell us where um, uh, chlorophyll are, in, and that's worked out. So this is the work of, of um, uh, uh, Amarjeet Singh, uh, Maxime Batalan, Michael Steely, Bin Zhang, Amit Darwal, uh, USC, Beth Stauffer, Stephanie Murthy, uh, Carl Oberg, uh, and uh, again, Dave Karen, Mark Hansen, and, and, and Gorov. Um, and this is the first time we've been able to do back-to-back -back, um, measurements uh, with ad adaptive sampling where th there's a ground truth. Uh, that offers a comparison. So here we are. Um, this is a map of actually chlorophyll concentration. So the, uh, right here indicates high concentration, blue, low concentration. So this is actually the presence then of these phytoplankton. Uh, <clears throat> this um, a first map that's shown here required uh, about 730 sample points. Um, now we picked a time in the day where this map was, was quasi-static. So we sampled again. Um, 
This time, um, using just the points shown here, just these points, which again were driven by our model. The model uh, relating the assumed um, uh, relationship between uh, the temperature profile and the presence of phytoplankton. So that predicts these points. Now, we only needed to, to do three quick, uh, in three different locations, we used this information to pin down the, the lake-wide temperature profile. Then that informed the location of these points, and that led to this reconstructed image. And we were able then to do this back to back so that, that uh, we can still use this data as a ground truth to compare. And the comparison is very good. The mean square error between these two is quite small. So, uh, and with a significant reduction in the number of sample points. So we're, you know, a factor of 4x improvement in speed. Um, so, um, this model based approach then is going to dominate um, our, our next set of, of, of of methods. I might just mention one last thing in terms of the biological sensor. Um, sometimes we, we run into the need to monitor phenomena that, for which a, a sensor is not available, and biological phenomena is a case like that. So physical sampling is also being explored where NIMS autonomously selects, uh, a draw, literally draws a sample from a canister and brings us back to shore. That was done here. The chlorophyll system only detects um, the fluorescent system, system only detects the presence of chlorophyll, not what kind of microbe is there. Uh, but at different depths, these are the different dominant kinds of microscopic animals that are, are found. So very interesting thing. This is important then to the biologists who would like to relate uh, the chlorophyll signal to, to actual um, uh, kinds of, of microbes that are present. Okay. Um, uh, any questions about sampling? I'll, I'll turn to another um, uh, uh, topic at this point. All right. Um, the next uh, problem in, in sampling uncertainty is sensor and node system activation. So we're going to look at, at um, a problem not of location, but of, of selecting platform resources. Um, this led to the development of, of the LEAP platform. And um, so I'll just um, describe what drives this. Again, um, New applications require high-performance sensors. We saw the examples earlier. Things like uh, our aquatic, marine, terrestrial, and seismic devices all have a need for um, high-performance sensors. The biomedical applications as well. Um, and all these sensors, again, require uh, computing support, processor performance, memory storage, um, high peak power demand. Um, and these may all operate with, with again, on-demand energy control. So this leads to a fundamentally different platform requirement. Network access is also changing rapidly. Broadband coverage is almost uh, uh, everywhere. Uh, that is, where there is an important system to be measured, there are probably people present, and that means there's probably already or will be Wi-Fi coverage. And the application characteristics have changed. High resolution measurements, large data payloads. And also, um, cost um, is no longer as large a concern. There are $1 32-bit uh, ARM processors available. So um, all this changes our selection. Now, um, another important microelectronics advance. Um, as transistor density increases, um, in the case of processors, those are devoted to, for example, architectural advances like pipelining. And as you know, pipelining leads to performance, but pipelining also leads to huge advances, advances in energy efficiency. Approximately, for standard CMOS, you would expect um, almost a linear relationship between the number of pipeline stages and, and energy reduction. So in the case of um, a high-end 32-bit processor like the, uh, like the Intel XGL, the latest versions, though, there's nine pipeline stages. So the 100 million transistors that are present um, actually lead to an energy efficiency. And here's just a quick comparison between um, the XGL PXA255 32-bit processor, again with this nine-stage pipeline, the ARM7 with a five-stage pipeline, both RISC uh, processors, or a simple single-stage microcontroller at, at, at Mega. And what you find is that um, the low-end uh, microprocessor of the past has low peak power, that's good, the high-end processor has high peak power, but the low-end processor has low energy efficiency. If we examine the energy required to, compute a, to complete a task, like cyclic redundancy check, FIR filter, or FFT, uh, the uh, relative efficiency um, is huge. Um, uh, the PXA may be 70 times more efficient. So 
Um, that's an enormous energy advance that's not been exploited in the past. Now, the same thing is true in the case of wireless. Yes. So there's variations between FIR and uh, FFT. Yes, yes. And, uh, do you know actually the, the reason behind that, the relative difference in terms of advantages compared with Advil? Uh, so, for, access, yes. so other things that they can account for? Um, it's, it's a good question. Um, I'll be able to tell you more soon. Uh, let me come back to that in a little bit. And I'll explain to you what, what we're doing now to, to sort this out. Your, um, um, memory is, was overlooked, and memory is really important. Uh, let me come back to it, to your question. I don't think I'll be able to give you an answer right now, but I can show you a path to that. So, um, now, in the case of, of, of wireless that, uh, interfaces, the same thing is true. Um, that is, uh, the, Devoting more transistor resources and more complexity to the implementation of an efficient wireless interface leads to more uh, energy efficiency. And you can sort of depend that industry will, uh, will drive this. That is, the p maximum power that, that um, um, you would expect for a wireless chipset is going to remain constant because it's driven by uh, consumer demand, yet the demand for bandwidth will continuously increase. So complexity will be used for more efficient use of the channel. Um, so, for example, there's about a 10x energy efficiency advantage that a high-end wireless interface like 802.11g has over um, an 802.15.4 uh, interface. All right. Now, I mention these because they were, they both drive, um, well, in the past, we had by default um, selected um, the low peak power wireless interfaces and processors. That's no longer the best selection. Okay. Now, this should lead to a new task-based design approach. Uh, many applications can, may activate resources at low duty cycle and achieve their goals. So we can assign tasks to proper node and proper modules. Um, the selection utility should include then energy efficiency. Um, so in order to achieve this task-based design, um, we need energy management and accounting. So we need to be able to sequence operations of each module, monitor, and then, of course, circumvent the constraints associated with transition time, like boot time or, or return from a suspend. The design challenge, then, going forward is how do we select sensors, processors, interfaces, and components, and application architectures, and optimize in-network performance? And um, I, I think, as you'll see, that's, a, that's about to become really, really um, very interesting. So just briefly, first generation LEAP, some of you heard about this, and I'll mention this briefly, and we'll talk about LEAP 2. Um, so the original LEAP architecture um, divided uh, the system up into two um, modules. One was a preprocessor that was responsible for, for most sensor interfaces, all narrowband sensor interfaces, uh, and narrowband radio, and was constantly vigilant at low power, milliwatt power level. And then all the other resources, like, for example, the high-end processor that is so energy efficient but must be used on demand, lies in a power domain along with its wireless interface and with sensors like, for example, high-end imagers that are, can be used occasionally. Energy is routed by the preprocessor, the Energy Management um, and Accounting Preprocessor, or EMAP, and um, then appropriately um, sequences energy. Now, um, that also means that the, that the EMAP preprocessor can contain the schedule that's developed at an application operating on the processor, that schedule then determining how the system should respond to events um, or the lack of events. So um, from a hardware architecture perspective, um, this first system used the uh, PXA255 X scale MSP430 preprocessor. And um, the preprocessor then was responsible for switching and, energy and managing energy. Um, that is, it monitored the current into each power domain and monitored uh, uh, and, and enabled control. Okay. Now, um, drilling down a little bit further, um, at the processor, um, a conventional Linux operating system is supported. Um, and at the EMAP, and the preprocessor, um, a um, the functions of scheduling, event detection, uh, sensing are all supported. And then there is uh, an API that we refer to as MSP client that uh, provides a link between an application at the processor and at the preprocessor so that a user could, for example, at 
the console uh, via, say, uh, for example, a command line interface, um, enter um, uh, a command to um, shut a system down at some point in the future, enable it to wake up according to an event, wake up according to some schedule, or to incorporate all of those features into an application, which is then responsive to events. Okay. Now, we developed this, and of course the objective then was to determine whether or not um, this was effective and whether it supported developers properly and whether developers could produce efficient systems. So MSP client um, enables access to sensors, to a total charge accumulated in each power domain, um, to uh, establishing triggers according to events. Triggers might be a change in uh, a sensor voltage, um, uh, a change in time uh, and slopes with, you know, of course, rising or falling. Power states, um, sleep, standby, resume. Um, and, it, and it provided also a way to examine the database of future events, uh, which could then be modified. Okay, yes? How do you reprogram the PM? So, uh, sorry, so the PM, okay, good question. Um, let me show you an example. The PM, um, and I think this is a, a good thing, uh, supports again conventional standard Linux. It could also, all of this um, could be Windows embedded, Windows CE, there's nothing. There's, the completely familiar development environment is present there. The new feature is the API that allows connection to the EMAP. Okay, so let me just give you some examples. Um, uh, right now, in terms of, of, of application development, our next generation seismic sensor, the one I first talked about, is now using the LEAP platform. Um, a marine sensor in Gorov Sokotny's group is using the LEAP platform. Uh, an environmental sensor is using LEAP. And what I'll talk about in terms of healthcare uses LEAP. Uh, and another thing called MicroLeap. But we've also had up to now about 150 student users in a series of undergraduate and graduate courses that have used this system um, in their own research. Um, and uh, sort of a landmark in this was the work by Sasank Reddy, Thomas Schmidt, Chris Marr, Dustin McIntyre, um, Kay Ho, and Bernie Yip. Uh, by the way, and I'll come back and talk about Dustin in a minute. Dustin developed uh, the LEAP um, architecture, and you'll have to hear from him at, 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 at some point. He's an amazing person, and I'll talk about him in, again in just a second and what he's done on LEAP too. Now, um, but here's this, by the way, so this was a class project in EE209 that won the SPOTS Best Demo Award last year. Um, uh, their application is the following. First, Sasak, Thomas, and Chris um, developed, and this is on Leap 1, um, a Linux-hosted uh, application, which um, did the following. They, uh, we provided them with a test bed of Leap nodes and cameras, uh, just like this, where the camera draws high peak power and should be used judiciously. The wireless interface also should be used judiciously. And so their objective is to maintain these, these systems off as much as possible while uh, maintaining a sensing objective. The problem then we gave them was, and all the students in the class, was the following. We have a, a test bed that includes, a, in a large laboratory, about the size of, of this, a long row of lights that, uh, along one wall, uh, which are actuated by a server system. And the lights produce um, a moving target. The moving target can be detected either by the camera or by a micropower presence detector, like the old military micropower sensor. It costs no energy to detect that the light has arrived. Sounds easy, except for the fact that we make the lights move fast, and we also don't allow them to move in any sort of regular pattern. We actually generate a test vector that's intended to break the <laughs> student's system. Um, it has to be continued. Oh it, it, it can be continuous. Um, actually, uh, it's unidirectional, um, but the arrival of an event and the speed with which it moves um, is unknown. And the objective is not just to detect the event, but to detect the velocity. So, so the, uh, the metric for performance was to uh, detect um, all the events and determine all their velocities. And in fact, the color of the event. Uh, you needed to detect whether it was a red light or a green light, for example, requiring that the appropriate signal processing algorithm operate in the PXA provided to the students, and, and so on. Now, um, the results were comp for each group were compared against um, the results of an oracle, a system that would know in advance when the light was going to arrive. So if you knew in advance when the light was going to arrive, you could, you could use just exactly the minimum energy to, to turn on your camera. Um, it's a 7-watt peak power camera. 
use it for just that, that instant of time, collect an image, and go back to sleep. Um, amazing result from this group is that they missed no events and they met the oracle energy uh, for the speeds that I had uh, selected, which um, uh, I found pretty staggering. Um, so Linux application um, uh, interactive across five nodes um, and their system was also adjustable to the number of nodes. That is, if, if um, not all nodes reported in, their system would accommodate that. And um, this is just a state diagram showing, for example, in a particular event moving with camera, processor, preprocessor, and so on. Um, their system opera was based upon a state machine that had communication, computation, suspend states, a color detection state, speed uh, determination state involving multiple nodes, and so on. And this just shows a sequence of operations for one particular node as a function of time. And um, the LEAP system also enables them to measure energy, so they got energy at all times. Okay. Anyway, that's... Sorry. Yes? What's the time scale of the uncertainty of the arrival time of the events? Um, so, uh, oh, I, I should, yes, I should qualify that. Um, the, um, so the events would either arrive um, once every, like, 800 seconds, every, I think, 320 seconds, or 160 seconds. Um, and um, they, with their particular system, did not exploit the, um, to a great degree the knowledge of that specific, specific time. Um, other students had other, you know, really very cool um, uh, uh, implementations as well. And it was remarkable. Um, so, okay, Leap 2. Now, um, that's the background. Leap 2 makes a, a big um, step forward. And um, Dustin had a really key concept here um, that uh, has paid off uh, marvelously. So um, the new platform, um, first of all, takes advantage of the, of the PXA270 class um, CPU, which has a much lower suspend power and is also much faster and wider range. It operates from 13 megahertz to 632 megahertz. He also increased the number of different options uh, from a so-called pseudo-static RAM, to SD RAM, to NAR flash, to NAND flash in terms of storage options. Um, then um, the EMAP I'll talk about in a second uh, follows, um, and then uh, using a stacking connector that he's uh, architecture he's developed, there's um, uh, other boards and options, imagers, and other other systems which we can talk about later. That's the the connector and conveying the the, the um, the notion here, whether it's multiple power, um, uh, multiple serial interfaces, uh, multiple power domains. Abiel? Yes. Can we go to the previous one? So what's the energy budget you have? Um, I'll, I'll come to that. I'll show you right now. Um, so okay. the, um, the PXA itself, well, I'll, I can show you a part of this. Um, the PXA itself shows this scaling. Anywhere from, from 5 milliamps uh, operating at 13 megahertz out of SRAM, which is really quite low, actually. I mean, that's almost like MICA-2 power levels, as I recall, uh, up to uh, you know, 200 milliamps um, at um, 600 megahertz. You made this to be a battery-operated device? Yes, yes, that's right. Even so, at really high power use? Even at high power, yes. So basically, the way to think about where does this fit into the power domain, um, the, the 270 appears on, um, in its variants on an, a lot of different cell phones. There's a number of Motorola. In fact, there's a number of Motorola-based Linux cell phones that use the 270. And the, the appropriate battery is this standard sort of lithium-ion. This is uh, what, 5,000? Uh, for this device? Yeah, MAH. Uh, I'm sorry? What's the capacity? Oh, oh um, um, I'm not sure what the current... Um, little lithium ions are up to, but they're, you know, I mean, those particular, the 270 based cell phones last for, you know, for days, so. Um, okay, now, um, here's the key difference um, between Leap 2 and Leap 1. In the Leap 1 case, remember we had the MSP430 processor monitoring energy, um, and it would monitor energy with a time resolution of, um, you know, uh, order of 100 milliseconds. Now, um, Leap 2 introduces high-speed sampling. So for each particular power domain, like for example, the NAND flash bank, NOR flash bank, uh, pseudostatic SRAM processor, and every one of the sensors, and Ethernet, wireless, every single one, 
is routed through a power switch and then through a high-speed current sensor and then uh, through an ADC. And then the sampling is done not by the MSP430, which would be too slow, but by um, an ASIC um, implemented using one of the one-time uh, programmable anti-fuse FPGAs. So this is a field programmable gate array, but of the one-time programmable variety. That means it's, um, it uses, instead of, a, of an SRAM for, uh, for selecting uh, uh, gates, it uses uh, an anti-fuse meaning it can be low power. So it's configurable and low power. One time configurable. Okay, now, so, but this then affords the speed that's required to sample the ADC fast. Um, now, and then we get some really interesting results from this. By the way, uh, this is what the EMAP board looks like. It also incorporates a, a low power radio system. Uh, I should mention, by the way, that TinyOS has been recently ported by uh, a Gorov's group to uh, this particular uh, platform in another variant I'll show you for the, the preprocessor. Okay, now here's the neat thing. High-speed energy accounting. So here we have, now let's examine on the processor side. Uh, the processor is operating. Um, up at the top we have a, a powerware application that someone wants to develop and we have a profiling tool. Now I would like to mention by the way and emphasize uh, that this was developed recently by Thanos Stathopoulos who spoke here I, I don't know, how many people heard Thanos' talk? Okay, so he, I, I'm sure his slides are online. You d definitely want to uh, take a, a look at those. So, um, high-speed energy accounting means we can, it's now possible to resolve energy on a per-process basis. That is, that is, when the Linux scheduler at each particular timer clock tick selects the next task, during that one millisecond, we can monitor the energy used by that particular process. So, that, that, that's a first. Um, I mean, as far as we know, that's not even done in general purpose computing. So, I mean, uh, what's done in the past normally is we might measure energy over some period of time, but we don't really have visibility as to what was operating. Um, so, um, we think this should also be extendable to all resources. That is, for example, instrumenting each system call, um, each interrupt, and others. In fact, we're using the K-probes tool in Linux to actually provide a movable probe uh, that can be placed around you know, any set of events. Um, so there's now an EMAP2 kernel module, um, there's a power domain scheduling module, and then there's a PROC interface. And what Thanos has developed is again something called ETOP, or Energy Aware Top, and this is a view, of, for, this is from Thanos' work, um, where in addition to the normal top view, one can examine for each particular task, or here's ETOP itself, or, or, or BASH, we can observe the energy being, the total energy that's dissipated since the last query, uh, and also the division between uh, kernel and user space energy. And then for a particular task, the assignment of energy to all of these different resources. So these are all the domains. So Ethernet, Imager, Radio, GPS, USB, Processor Module, SDRAM, NORS, uh, the entire, entire thing. Okay, so that I, we don't think that was ever possible before. Again, on... Um, I mean, maybe somebody instrumented at one point a, a motherboard with um, a digital signal analyzer and this, but we don't, this is now available um, all, all the time. Okay. This is how we do it. That's, uh, actually, so um, uh, ETOP gives us actually an, an energy usage. So we, we measure instantaneous power, but we can also integrate that. So the EMAP actually integrates um, and gives us either, you know, total charge that goes into a domain and then with the knowledge of the voltage in that domain, uh, energy. So, for example, it takes into account the fact that, that as we swing um, processor speed, we, we change uh, voltage. Okay, now, this has led to an energy-aware uh, operating system opportunity um, that we think is you know, are very significant. Um, so it's a novel measurement capability. Um, now, in networking, there's countless examples. Um, there's network... What's important now in then determining energy usage is the network interface, the network environment, the protocol, processor, and storage interaction. Give you a quick example. Uh, just take two nodes communicating over a Wi-Fi link with um, communicating over a Wi-Fi link and perhaps supporting an application that might read from NAND flash on one node, transportable over the Wi-Fi link with an application. Um, uh, maybe wget is being used to transfer the file, and that file is being stored in uh, a file system. Now, 
what you find immediately because you have this visibility is that given knowledge of the bandwidth available at the link at that time, there is an optimal processor speed selection. If the speed is too high, we're going to idle. If the speed is too low, we won't keep the transmit buffer full. So that big advantage we saw in terms of, of, of energy advantage for the broadband interface is not, not available. So uh, right away we've been able to observe that minimum. So, and again, that wasn't really available before. There's other um, amazing phenomena uh, that you know, maybe you would have anticipated but, but um, may not have been able to measure before. Like one, for example, is the process of, um, uh, of writing. So Feng, you asked earlier about memory. So here's an example. Um, just take the simple operation of observing the energy usage in uh, the NAND flash system, the processor NSD RAM during a write operation. What uh, one finds is that when the write operation starts, there's of course a pulse of, of energy usage by the processor, SD RAM energy rises, NAND flash energy is low. After several seconds, um, NAND flash energy rises and remains high and then falls. Um, I, bet, I bet you know why, I mean, do you know why that is? I, I bet Jeremy you would know right away. The, um, sorry, I don't mean to just... Sorry, is it because you're trying to, when you're, you're saying when you're writing to the local... Yes, so you're, 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 uh, you're writing, so the process is this, uh, a file begins arriving. Um, we're going to write this into NAND flash and what we observe is that um, energy in SDRAM is high, NAND flash energy is low, yet seconds later NAND flash energy rises. Probably a flash array cycle. Uh, exactly. What's happened actually is that the um, Linux um, storage and virtual memory system are operating together to allocate um, um, a file cache where all this data arrives, ends up in SDRAM, and sec several seconds later the um, uh, thread that uh, is responsible for flushing gets activated and, and fills this. So but it leads, by the way, to a challenge for resource accounting. The energy that your task used might, might be accrued several seconds later. But that's, that's pretty cool. Now, so there's an, certainly an opportunity to optimize here. There's an op definitely an opportunity to optimize here. There's examples where you might make actually what would be regarded as normally an unorthodox decision as to the use of a, of a RAM-based file system and a flash file system by keeping knowledge of, of whether or not um, a file might be volatile or, or may be allowed to be volatile. Virtual memory. SDRAM is a big energy user. As Feng, you asked about this. Uh, uh, RAM is a large energy user. There's examples where um, we may want to reduce the size of our memory map. That's going to be complicated, but that could also be done at runtime. So it's on-demand uh, memory mapping. Scheduling, clearly an opportunity here. And then uh, application support, profiling systems and language extensions. Language extensions like the analogy of prefetch um, that might be used for filling a process of data cache. Pre uh, some analogy to that might set up the operating system and uh, other services on a platform appropriately. So one more quick thing. Um, I talked before about, um, so, we have uh, the leap capabilities then on the processor and preprocessor. As it turns out, the new preprocessor for Leap 2 is actually this board, which can operate plugged into Leap 2 or can be unplugged and operate as a separate standalone node. Um, we've developed this for um, uh, applications in uh, biomedical, um, but a version of this also contains an 802.15.4 radio. So by the way, that's Bluetooth based for, uh, uh, because that turns out to be the important interface for, for biomedical. It's an MSP430. It contains, again, an energy management unit, just like the large-scale platform. Uh, and the interface architecture is also MSP client, but it's really cool. So if, you have, if you're developing on the Linux platform, you can communicate with this and schedule its operation just as if it was connected to your platform or if it's um, 50 feet away. Um, and the Bluetooth link supports that. Um, you can, um, again, uh, operate it. So. Anyway, the current activity right now, um, Leap 2 and micro, MicroLeap, this is all um, open source. Um, <clears throat> there's a, a set of LabVIEW interfaces that manage this that are intended for uh, support of, of um, multiple um, application users. There's a Leap testbed, a second generation Leap testbed under development now, and then there are these applications. And we plan to have a, a, a workshop in fall 
to focus on this whole new class of platforms that so many people are developing that each emphasize different different roles in this space. Uh, what, what's the sensing uh, requirement? A, a good question. Um, <coughs> I, um, I kept you guys a long time. I could say a few more words about telehealth if you have a minute. If I don't mind, if, you, if I could uh, impose on you for about another five minutes. So um, I'll, um, so. I, before you get to that, um, you're running Linux on the PM, right. uh, the big PSA PM, yes. node. Uh, what's the software environment for the uh, small one, the EMAP? Ah, uh, we're using, um, th right now, okay, um, we're using the micro COS environment for um, that. However, uh, that's just one option. Um, Karthik Dantu and Manzi Shah, uh, who are students of Gorov Sukhatmi's group, have um, uh, ported TinyOS to um, uh, all of the preprocessor platforms. In fact, they demoed that at, at, uh, at Spots. Um, and uh, that turns out to be very attractive. So basically, um, you can think of MicroLeap as being then an energy-aware moat. But uh, you, you, in your lab, uh, there's the SOS. Uh, yes. Have you, what's the constant uh, number of uh, compared with uh, TinyOS for your power? SOS will be another very, very interesting um, uh, option, and in particular also, especially with the fact that, that mobile, um, you know, mobile code could also be, um, uh, and the unique SOS, um, you know, transport of, of modules could be very interesting in, in uh, reprovisioning a system on demand. Um, um, the, um, uh, and in particular, I'll mention some uh, collaboration between David Gia and Mani's group and Winston Wu and the telehealth area that, that, re that relates to that. So, um, So telehealth, um, I'll try to be uh, quick about this. I, I, I've kept you guys, and I appreciate your, your, your patience. So the, by the way, the connection here, um, <clears throat> we've been focused on this problem of, of adapting node systems to various environments. We looked at the case of like, large-scale environments. We looked at, at Leap. Here's another example where we're applying these same principles that come from um, sampling and our statistics colleagues and planning from our robotics colleagues to this problem in telehealth. This area has been growing at UCLA since about 97, uh, when the sensor network field began to grow as well. Uh, but it's, much more, it's grown much more rapidly in the last several years. And now um, I'll just say a few words about the, the current state. Um, so in telehealth, the enabling technology is basically ubiquitous wireless access. Now that um, there are billions of cell phones on Earth, um, and that we know that, that uh, it's very convenient for people to add uh, a Bluetooth wireless headset. There's no reason why we can't add uh, Bluetooth-based, uh, for example, uh, biomedical sensors. The, the vision we have, and I think that's true for uh, all the people in the telehealth program, is that um, it's not going to be more than 10 years from now, um, probably less, that you'll walk into uh, your wireless store, like a Verizon store, and buy um, off the rack, a blister pack that contains a sensor, and then go home, and just as easily as you would have downloaded a new ringtone, you would download um, an application for health, wellness, or some other uh, opportunity. I know this has been talked about for a while, but I'll just mention some recent events in the community that, that, uh, cause, us to, that cause us to now to become, I think, very important for us. So there's patient and consumer monitoring, home and workplace. There's wearable instruments and standalone instruments. There's applications for the consumer, fitness and wellness, for healthcare, and for public health. Um, uh, I've mentioned to people this morning just like the range of different things uh, from stroke detection, where the, the person that leads our stroke center on campus, which is um, the head center in 30 centers around the US, is engaged in this. And at the same time, um, a group in public health and in nursing is working together on a telehealth application intended to reduce the incidence of, of alcohol and drug abuse through a, a, a coaching process. Their research shows that this will have an impact. So this, the, the breadth is enormous. There's many industry opportunities, wireless platforms and services. Uh, Qualcomm just recently started a new company called Lifecom, and actually the funding for that they raised via an outside round. Um, that's a $100 million new, new startup. Um, there's many sensors and instruments, so companies that are in the biomedical space, like Medtronics, for example, are there. Medical informatics, and of course, Microsoft's uh, uh, healthcare uh, presence is, is enormous. 
and uh, as here and there. So uh, there's challenges ahead. One is establishing the set of standards required for this. The procedures, the protocols, algorithms. We know how important standards are in every other community. They have to be here too. In fact, the new industry um, uh, partners in this particular space see a huge advantage of an industry ecosystem uh, that enables interoperability. And of course, that requires this. And then autonomous operation. Now, Certification process that are actually very unique to this industry then. Very unique. Right? Exactly, exactly. There's a whole range. The health and wellness things can, can proceed, you're right, without maybe much oversight, um, although we'll see. And then there are a set of things that require huge um, regulatory uh, issues. Now, in terms of at, at UCLA, um, if we look at, at, at various schools and engineering, uh, and I don't mean to, by the way, list engineering first. It's just one of many players. Um, there are departments in letters and science, nursing, public health, public affairs, uh, the law, uh, very much very big interest here in the problem of privacy. What's interesting is that the regulatory rules associated with, with health care transport of medical data do not actually encompass any of this. Um, uh, there's the input of data from a service other than a doctor or a patient entering that data by hand. Um, then business, um, and then intellectual property, um, all, um, all engaged. In the School of Medicine, um, uh, this is actually just a subset of the interests. Um, in some groups like radiology, there are you know, six people involved in this particular area with substantial funding. Um, we have um, actually um, 40 people getting together for a regular planning meeting um, just next, next Wednesday in this particular uh, space. Um, this is the view for telehealth. Um, and again, I think you've, you've, you could anticipate that it would look like this, and you've probably thought up, uh, this through. Um, again, the key point now is that suddenly there are very large investments being made. So um, it's a good time, I think, for um, uh, all of us. But the view then is the patient is in their home or workplace, uh, and for now, probably interacting with their sensors over Bluetooth, that is their wearable device, whether it's a PDA or a cell phone, and with devices that are in their home, like a weight scale. Um, for example, someone suffering from uh, congestive heart disease should be weighed several times per day to manage fluid levels. Um, just ensuring compliance with that is, um, is very difficult. Um, that's going to require then that, that, this, that we that the extension of all the sensors and instruments um, in include many things that are going to be used on demand and maybe um, as guided by the system itself. That is, when a patient should take an action is going to be determined by the system itself. Communication can be local Wi-Fi and then back to, um, or cellular, and back to a, a centralized infrastructure. And a centralized infrastructure, um, patient data is available. And that data will then also flow back and enable a reconfiguration of the system. Um, just to give you a quick example problem up that's being pursued is um, the one of um, patient state detection. So the objective here is to determine whether a patient is limping or not, and whether the limp is in the left or the right leg. Um, our medical informatics group and our group pursued this, um, and it's been very successful. Um, the problem here is another interesting uncertainty problem uh, that's characteristic of telehealth. What sensor should be used and when? The required sensor set, just like in, you know, in monitoring a river, is not known in advance. We don't know what sensor to use. Um, the patient also might find that only a subset of the required sensors are conveniently wearable. They might not wear, want to wear any sensors all the time and only some sensors a part of the time. Um, there's energy constraints. Um, and then there's the issue of both um, uh, communication and sensor node activation. So um, the architecture we, we've followed at, at this point seems standard. There are uh, sensors like the, the uh, device I talked about, the, the micro leap that operate down here that provide support to the wearable sensor. Transport back then to uh, a, a personal server. In this case, is a, a, a Nokia N770 um, Linux-based uh, PDA and its Bluetooth interface, and then a communication back to um, a centralized system. Now, um, the uh, result of the research by Winston Wu and Maxime Batalon and Alex Bowie in the School of Medicine um, 
uh, was this. Winston and Alex are both uh, um, Bayesians in their approach to uh, sensor fusion. And uh, this is the result of, the, of their system. So in working with them, um, so the objective here is for rehabilitative medicine, for monitoring the progress that a patient is making in overcoming limp. Um, the objective was to build a system and prove that it, it could operate in this incremental fashion and detect limp reliably. So the patient is here. The patient takes an action. Um, a sensor is activated. Um, data is transferred back to a device server. The device server then extracts features from the sensor, which includes things like frequency and amplitude and frequency distribution. This data is classified, providing evidence for uh, a Bayesian network. The Bayesian network infers um, the presence of limp, the degree of limp, that is, and there's ways of measuring the degree of limp. And, and then um, I, the result um, of a utility function is then computed here to determine whether or not, if uh, I required inference uh, certainty is not met, what should be done? That might involve the selection of a sensor and which sensor. And um, in the case of gate, uh, there's a, um, uh, an approach for that. The key thing is that the user, um, the expert, can uh, modify this decision um, in uh, two ways. One, setting a cost for the level of inconvenience that a patient feels for selecting a sensor, and also the cost associated with the misdiagnosis. Um, so uh, an interface here at the N770 and then a corresponding uh, interface here in real time for the, uh, at the centralized system. Um, here is a patient wearing this uh, equipment, um, accelerometers, uh, pulse oximeter, and so on and so forth. And I, I know uh, many of these things are familiar to everyone who's examined um, this uh, space before. Um, there's MicroLeap on the left with um, an accelerometer board, um, a knee angle sensor, and an ECG. Um, typical data um, showing, um, in this case, um, uh, acceleration uh, time series for um, uh, a patient uh, that is limping, comparing the, the two uh, legs, the, well, the able leg and the um, uh, afflicted leg. Um, so this system was, was successful in being able to monitor and then autonomously select, advise the patient, um, and select a new sensor. Um, so it, it was able to autonomously reduce um, uncertainty um, that you can see here in this confusion matrix. Here's an example where um, um, our experiment was the following. With multiple subjects, subjects were equipped with um, shoe inserts that led to a limp. Um, the, this was a calibrated limp that our School of Medicine colleagues um, could observe and um, you know, um, correspond to, to events of interest to them. A calibrated limp, so the limp could be uh, one, two, um, uh, of amplitude of one or two, that corresponds to a thickness of a shoe insert on the left or right leg, or normal. And so, um, our objective is to be able to um, uh, measure and predict limp and then um, uh, accurately predict um, actual patient state. Without knee sensors, that is, with acceleration alone, uh, there is um, a potential for error. These maximum, th this by the way, is the inference certainty for a given limp condition. Um, it might range above 70%. Um, but um, there is a potential for a misdiagnosis, and it might not be large enough to require action, depending upon what the user demand is. Depending upon which sensor, which leg is being instrumented, uh, there's a, a change in, in uh, certainty. Um, if we actually add a sensor that monitors knee angle, which is uh, expensive for the user to wear, and its certainty improves if both are available. Certainty is very high. So, um, uh, a series of experiments, again, in four patients showed um, uh, basically, uh, actually, error-free prediction for those particular patients um, with the ability of instructing the patient uh, when to select new sensors. So we refer to this as incremental diagnosis. Um, it's being applied now to re rehabilitative guidance, and it's being extended in research to uh, uh, a pulmonary disease. Um, and 
uh, it's also being extended uh, to move from the convenience weighted cost function to an energy aware cost function. So um, I'll just uh, con conclude now. Um, and I, I really, I went way over, and I, I, I appreciate your questions. And um, so, first of all, on the actuated sensing front, um, we have a demonstrated solution for environmental observation, um, uh, with a major emphasis now on aquatic systems. There are international applications and partners. The National Neon Program has adopted NIMS. There is a commercial NIMS system now, and uh, we look forward to that being applied. Um, the challenges ahead are really for uh, large-scale regional monitoring, uh, like an entire river uh, length. On LEAP, um, there are many new design optimization op opportunities, and I'm hoping this afternoon we can talk about that. Um, uh, and then there's applications in, in development. And then in telehealth, I'm, um, this area probably will start to overtake us and end up uh, focusing uh, much of our attention in the coming years. I think what's exciting about it is that it really embraces, um, I think, everything we've done in sensor network theory and experiments virtually. There's almost, I think, all the lessons learned from um, past work, um, almost all, I think, apply here. And there's also a great deal of work that we find from the robotics space regarding planning and scheduling that's also going to be applied. Um, and because it's um, um, uh, nationally urgent, and there's now industry interest. We're finding that federal sponsors like NIH and NSF are also very supportive. So um, we're hoping to um, work with you on this in the uh, coming years. And there are things, for example, that are underway right now, like Amman's new participatory sensing system that allows a rapid upload of data from uh, uh, sensor systems anywhere. Um, you can imagine that, that if you extend these ideas uh, to um, further, um, healthcare will not just be managed by large organizations, but there might be communities of, of individuals that participate in healthcare and you know learning about their own um, their own health. So, anyways, thanks very much.